Hello friends, Bishop Andy C. Luda here, and I'm so delighted to be collaborating with Urban Ministries out of Chicago, Illinois, to bring you a weekly international Bible study Sunday school lesson. A uh, resident expert from UMI will be sharing with you in just a minute, but I wanted to come to you first and let you know how vital I think this is. This is uh, designed for those who teach Sunday school, for those who have a heart for Sunday school, even those who are in Christian education. And while it was originally designed for a Sunday school ministry, it is certainly useful for small group ministry. And as pastors and Christian educators, I'm sure you will find a wide array and an assortment of uses for this material. Listen, I am Bishop Andy C. Luter, and I am so delighted to share with you these weekly lessons from the International Sunday School Curriculum. As a believer, what gives you hope? Hi, I'm Dr. Laverne Tolbert. Welcome to Sunday School Made Simple, the fastest growing online community of Christian education teachers and students of the Word. Happy Resurrection Sunday! And thank you for joining us as we continue to explore the Word of God using the Precepts for Living commentary based on the International Uniform Lesson Series. Please remember to ring the bell at the bottom of this video to subscribe to our show so that you don't miss out on any new lessons. And teachers, why not be equipped so that your students don't merely download information but actually receive revelation? Subscribe to PreceptsForLivingOnline.com for complete lesson plans and additional resources. When you subscribe, you'll have access to precepts on your tablet, phone, or laptop. <laughs> so go to PreceptsForLivingOnline.com and get your resources today. Each week, we make Sunday School simple with an easy to understand format. The text for you students of the word and teaching tips for those of you who teach. Are you ready? Let's pray. For being our hope, Father, we thank you. For being our strength and our wisdom, we thank you. Bless this lesson in Jesus' name, amen. Today's lesson is Continuing the spring quarter, which is entitled Justice and the Prophets. And it focuses on the Old Testament prophets and God's justice. This second unit of lessons features promises of God's just kingdom, ultimately revealed through Jesus Christ, but it had been expected for generations. Today's lesson title is Resurrection Hope which teaches the resurrection of Jesus Christ through the eyes of Paul in 1 Corinthians. Let's explore the text with our lesson aim. By the end of the lesson, we will contrast or analyze the first Adam and the last, anticipate a new resurrected life different from this present one, and embrace the call to proclaim the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, despite ridicule or resistance. Let's read our first set of verses from our scripture lesson in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 4, and I'm reading from the New Living Translation. Let me now remind you, dear brothers and sisters, of the good news I preached to you before. You welcomed it then and you still stand firm in it. It is this good news that saves you if you continue to believe the message I told you, unless, of course, you believe something else that was never true in the first place. I passed on to you what was most important and what had also been passed on to me. Christ died for our sins, just as the scripture says. He was buried and he was raised from the dead on the third day, just as the scriptures said. What's important to know? You know, we talk about what's important to know, feel and do, cognitive, affective and psychomotor, just to remind you. 
Well, there are two key points to know from 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 4. Paul preaches the gospel of Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ died for our sins, was buried, and resurrected the third day. Let's look at the background and context for these verses. The Apostle Paul is writing a letter to the growing church at Corinth to correct several pastoral and doctrinal issues. The word doctrine means truth or teaching. And Paul has to correct the false teachings or doctrines that are misleading the church. The core teaching or key doctrine that Paul clarifies is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Remember that in the early church, the gospel was spread from one place to another by word of mouth, or what we call the oral tradition. It wasn't until the end of the mid to late first century AD that the four gospels we have today were written. Paul's letter in 1 Corinthians is actually one of the earliest written accounts of the gospel. And Paul wrote these letters before the other apostles wrote their four Gospels. So, why is the Apostle Paul writing? There are several major problems. Church members are mistreating the poor, they're abusing their spiritual gifts, and there is sexual immorality. Yes, in the church. <laughs> And false teachers outside of the church are preaching false doctrines, insisting that new Gentile believers keep Jewish traditions according to the law in order to be followers of Jesus. Others teach that rituals have to be performed to make new people a part of the body of Christ. These disputes were intense. Teachers were saying that believers could live any way they wanted because their spirits were clean. In other words, this doctrine taught that believers could continue to sin. And there were those who were trying to convince converts that Jesus Christ had never risen from the dead. He simply died like the prophets or revolution, revolutionaries, excuse me, before him. Since there was no resurrection, how they lived didn't matter. That's what they were teaching. And still others were teaching that Jesus really didn't die because he really wasn't human. Then there were others who were extremely legalistic to the point of self-denial and constant fasting to punish their bodies so they could be worthy of resurrection. Well, Paul addresses all of these issues in his first letter to the church because he was the apostle who planted or started this church. Let's read the next set of verses from this lesson from 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 5 through 8. And again, I'm reading in the New Living Translation. He was seen by Peter and then by the twelve. After that, he was seen by more than 500 of his followers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have died. Then he was seen by James and later by all the apostles. Last of all, as though I had been born at the wrong time, I also saw him. There are two key points from the verses in this lesson. The apostles saw the resurrected Christ, and many others saw the resurrected Christ. You'll see that in addition to alliteration, we're also repeating those words so that we can help remember our points. Well, Paul is adding further support that Jesus physically resurrected from the dead. It's not a matter of one person's testimony. His resurrection is attested by the testimonies of hundreds. First, Peter and the 12 disciples saw the resurrected Christ. These were the ones who were closest to him, who had followed him around for three years, who knew him intimately, and who recognized that he had risen from the grave. You see the empty tomb here. The stone is rolled away. 
those disciples would be the first ones to tell if someone else was pretending to be Jesus, but they saw him in the flesh. Paul knows that some people would say that wasn't enough. Perhaps the apostles were simply not telling the truth or they were delusional because their leader had been killed. So Paul shares more evidence. Over 500 people at the same time had seen the resurrected Jesus. This is not a case of mistaken identity for so many people to have seen a man alive who had been dead. And this wasn't a mirage. People had seen Jesus. This is Paul's evidence. James and all the apostles saw Jesus Christ again on another occasion. After explaining all of this, Paul makes it personal. If they don't believe the other witnesses, Paul, the one who had preached the gospel to them in the first place, the one who started the church, he saw Christ resurrected with his own eyes on the road to Damascus. There's no doubt the evidence is overwhelming. Jesus Christ, who died for their sins, had also risen from the dead. The next set of verses for this lesson are from 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 12 to 14. But tell me this, since we preach that Christ rose from the dead, why are some of you saying there will be no resurrection of the dead? For if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, then all our preaching is useless and your faith is useless. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. He is the first of a great harvest of all who have died. So you see, just as death came into the world through one man, now the resurrection from the dead has begun through another man. Just as everyone dies because we all belong to Adam, everyone who belongs to Christ will be given new life. But there is an order to this resurrection. Christ was raised as the first of the harvest, and then all who belong to Christ will be raised when he comes back. And you can see I actually read verses 12 through 23. I read the rest of that passage right there instead of 12 to 14, as I said earlier. Well, what are the key points in this? If Christ did not die, then our faith is useless. I'm sorry, if Christ did not raise from the dead, our faith is useless. But Christ did rise from the dead and we will also be resurrected. Paul is continuing his case for anyone who does not believe that Christ resurrected. His appeals are based on logic and common sense. If people believe Christ resurrected, they can't say there's no resurrection of the dead. And if Christ is resurrected, it's illogical to believe that there will not be a resurrection for other people as well. If he resurrected and we belong to him, we too will resurrect as well. If people don't believe that Christ rose from the dead, then why are they even coming to church? <laughs> Paul makes one of the boldest and most pivotal claims in the Christian faith. If Jesus did not resurrect, then our faith is useless. It's vain. It's empty. So Paul draws a doctrinal line in the sand. <laughs> to be a Christian is to believe that Jesus Christ rose from the dead. We're not followers of a dead Savior, but thanks be to God, our Savior did resurrect. And we know that everyone who is human dies. So Paul reminds his listeners that they will all die someday, but everyone who follows Christ will raise from the dead. Isn't that a beautiful hope? I'm sorry, just had to put that pin in there. <laughs> oh my goodness. Thank God we've been given a new nature through Christ because he is risen, we will rise again. 
One man, Adam, brought death into the world through sin, and all the death in the world ties back to the sin which Paul traces to Adam. But in a parallel fashion, all the resurrection in the world can be tied back to Jesus Christ, who resurrected and now lives forever. Because of Jesus, we will live eternally. And Christians must believe that Jesus died for our sins, was buried, and rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. This is our hope of resurrection and life after death. The final set of verses for this lesson are from 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 42 to 45. It is the same way with the resurrection of the dead. Our earthly bodies are planted in the ground when we die, but they will be raised to live forever. Our bodies are buried in brokenness, but they will be raised in glory. They are buried in weakness, but they will be raised in strength. They are buried as natural human bodies, but they will be raised as spiritual bodies. For just as there are natural bodies, there are also spiritual bodies. The scriptures tell us the first man, Adam, became a living person, but the last Adam, that is Christ, is a life-giving spirit. Ooh, don't you want to just shout right through there? Oh my goodness, what good news, what good news. There are two key points from these verses in our lesson today. The first Adam is a natural man, but the last Adam is a life-giving spirit. I know this lesson seems long, but what Paul is sharing today is foundational to our faith. And he launches into a mystery of death that he obviously believes plagues these believers. Because of the sin of the first man, Adam, the natural bodies of all humankind are subject to death. However, praise be to God. Because of the redemptive act of the last Adam, Jesus Christ, believers now possess spiritual bodies. Paul asserts that these bodies are incorruptible. They're no longer subject to the laws of nature and the penalty of sin, which is death. <laughs> if believers were only subject to the inheritance of Adam, it would be fitting that we return to dust since it's through Adam's sin that mankind dies. However, through faith, believers are joined to Jesus Christ. The bodies of believers, though through their faith in him, we now bear the image of the heavenly. As stated in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 15 through 14, that's when Paul talks about bearing the image of the heavenly. So these glorified heavenly bodies are the resurrected bodies the believer's glorious inheritance of in Christ is the hope of the resurrection. This ought to give comfort to anyone who has experienced any loss. If someone you love has passed away, a husband, a wife, a mother, a child. Oh my goodness, take, take hope in these words that we will live with Christ forever. Well, that's what's important to know. What's important to feel? I just said it. We should feel hopeful. <laughs> Christ is risen. Jesus Christ is risen from the dead. And because Jesus Christ rose from the dead, we have hope and the assurance that death for us is not final. Jesus overcame death itself and <laughs> If Jesus can overcome death, he can overcome any situation we face. We have the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead living inside us. And this gives us hope for any situation, no matter how bad that situation may be. Jesus Christ, he's more powerful than anything we could face. And greater is he that is in you than he that's in the world. Jesus has promised us eternal life because he is eternal life. He's not dead. He's risen just as 
he said. That's what's important to feel. What should we do in response to today's lesson? We should proclaim our resurrected Savior to the world. <laughs> it doesn't get any more simple than that. Jesus Christ died. He was buried. He rose again from the dead, as he said he would. And we must preach and teach the gospel of Jesus Christ. Jesus, he is our hope for salvation in this life and in the life to come. We are people of the only God who was alive today. We have resurrection life through Christ, and we may see death and destruction all around us, but we know that this is not the end of the story. The injustice we see, that's not the final word either. God has the final word. Christ is risen. And we have salvation through faith in his name and resurrection life in him. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. What a wonderful lesson for this resurrection celebration. That was a long lesson, wasn't it? That's our text for today. Now, let's talk about how to effectively teach this lesson. Don't forget to pray. Pray for your students that they would have receptive hearts and minds to be obedient to God's word, that you'll be creative and use a variety of methods to help your students understand. And pray that your students will apply what they learn to their lives. Now, on Resurrection Sunday, expect to have new people in your class. They may not necessarily be believers. So make sure you pray. You cover your class in prayer. In fact, you know when I teach in a classroom, I lay hands on the chairs, on the desks, on the walls, on the doors, and I pray and intercede for those who are coming in that nothing will distract them or prevent them from hearing. And we don't want them to miss any of this good news. <laughs> Now, you may download the lesson plan and the Word Made Simple from PreceptsForLivingOnline.com. I know you're, you might be missing the Word Made Simple, but it's there. So go to PreceptsForLivingOnline.com and download that. Now, before we go into how to teach this lesson, let me say this. One of the best ways to teach is to build upon students' prior knowledge. In other words, with your learners, Start where they are before introducing new information. Paul modeled this beautifully in his letter when he explained the gospel or good news. Well, now let's begin this lesson with our hook or open the lesson by asking our students, why is the resurrection good news for believers? If your classroom is a smart classroom, write and project the points onto a screen or television or project a picture of the empty tomb. <laughs> By the way, this is the 21st century, so every classroom should be a smart classroom with video screens and computers. Get that into your budget. Now, once you do that hook, you can download the InFocus video from PreceptsForLivingOnline.com and answer the following question at the end. What resurrections has God performed in your life? That's what the students will discuss. Good discussion. For children, let them celebrate that Jesus is alive. <laughs> Teach the gospel in simple terms without going into the details of the false doctrines that prompted the Apostle Paul to write his letter. And in your class celebration, be sure to have lots of goodies, pictures to color, and perhaps some treats for them to take home. They can share with their parents or show their parents. Make your class fun for the little ones. Well, back to teaching this lesson. Now we're ready for book or present the scriptures. Of course, invite volunteers to read the entire portion of the scriptures. And again, new people are going to be in the class. Don't call on anyone. Let your students volunteer to read. And then ask, what stood out to you or what resonated with you from the verses? We want to keep students engaged and talking, and that's why we ask this question. And now, read the in-depth paragraphs which explain the scriptures. Rich, beautiful information here. 
teacher, be sure to study these paragraphs in advance so that if you need to answer any questions or summarize the information, you'll know what to say. And now you're ready for look or explore the meaning. Answer the questions in the lesson. And one of those powerful questions that should lead to an important discussion is this. How has the resurrection of Christ impacted your life? When teaching children, if the weather permits, and if you have enough volunteers and it's safe enough, why not walk them outside to, to see the flowers that are beginning to bud? Talk about the new life in springtime and relate this to Jesus Christ rising from the dead. That's a fun activity for your children. And then transition into took or next step for application. Ask a volunteer to read Liberating Lesson. There's wisdom in a discussion comparing Jesus' trial and conviction based upon false charges with the injustice of today's um, justice system. I wanted to say injustice system, but anyway, you discuss that, what, how that applies to us today. And then for application for activation, ask each person to read this paragraph. Now, after they read application for activation, give everyone a card to write one reason they are grateful for the resurrection of Jesus Christ and invite them to share their reflections with the class. Have everyone stand and you can Ask them again one word why you're grateful for the resurrection and then hold hands and pray together. May the Holy Spirit guide you as you teach. Fast and pray during this week that many will come to know the Lord this Resurrection Sunday. And now let's talk mailbag. And welcome to Mailbag. And here we are with our resident theologian, millennial, <laughs> Minister Alan Reynolds, who has so much wisdom. And he's been to Israel, so you can really lend some insight on to this question. Mm -hmm. So Paul dealt with false teachings when he wrote 1 Corinthians. And today we still deal with false teachings. Mm -hmm. There are some that teach that Jesus could not have risen in three days as the scriptures say, because there are not three 24 hour days between Friday night mm -hmm. and Saturday morning. Mm -hmm. And they actually contradict scripture and they teach this right. without recognizing the importance of the culture. But I want you to answer that and address how is it that Jesus could have risen from the dead when he died on Friday and rose Sunday morning as the scripture said. Explain it to our viewers so they don't ever believe any false teaching. So big important thing is understanding not only first century Jewish culture, right? This is living under the Roman Empire, but also really more what it means to be Jewish in general and how their festi festivals work, how their cultures work, how Passover works, which is happening during Jesus's um, death and resurrection. So first of all, mm -hmm. a Jewish calendar doesn't work like ours. Our days start at midnight and go till midnight, you know, the following day. A Jewish day starts at sundown and goes until sunrise. Okay, right? so that's so key. Yes. So it, when you recognize that, instead of saying, you know, I would wait for 1159 tonight to know that it's tomorrow, a Jewish person doesn't do that. They wait until the sun goes down and it's tomorrow, right? So Jesus is operating during the Passover festival. We know there's a whole lot of people in Jerusalem at the time. And we know that Passover festival has a certain number of days that it has to go on during. Him and his disciples take bread, they break it. By the time you get to Friday, it technically, it, Friday morning to sundown is a previous day. And the Romans would have crucified Jesus on that day and counted it as a day. Reason why is because the Sabbath is Friday evening to Saturday evening. So no activity could take place in Jerusalem on the Sabbath. Otherwise, those priests, those religious leaders who were accusing Jesus wouldn't have been able to take part. People wouldn't have come out to see him. It would have defeated the purpose of having a crucifixion in the first place. 
right? So Jesus dies on Friday and we get actually the, it lays it out in scripture, the times that he died, right? He's yes. on the cross, noon, high noon, yes. where their sun should have been shining the brightest. The sun is darkened. By the time it's three o'clock, Jesus is already dead, right? We get that in the scripture. And again, the sun hasn't set. So it's still the first day. Sun goes down. Jesus is taken from the cross, laid in the tomb. Now it's day two there on Friday night, yes. right? We're counting all the way to Saturday evening. And then day three is going to start on Saturday evening, right? Sun comes up and it's still the third day yes. when Jesus rise, right, rises from the dead. So it's not three 24-hour periods. It's the third day, the right? Third day. So on the first day he dies, right? On the second day, he's in the tomb. On the third day, he rises because the sun has risen and it is still technically the previous day, right? So Jesus dies on the first day and raises on the third day. According, according to, to the, the scriptures. scriptures. The scriptures, this is our reliable source. And if we don't understand the culture of the times, who was writing, to whom they're writing, when they're writing, we can't interpret scripture. We don't read the text from mm -hmm. our 21st century viewpoint and think that it's supposed to make sense. It absolutely does it. And Minister Allen, you've explained it so beautifully that I trust no one out there doubts at all that Jesus rose according to the scripture. Yes. Is there anything you'd like to add? Yes, just to clarify there, because I said it's the third day on Sunday, right? He's died before the first day of being in the tomb, right? So that's important to recognize so that he can be in the tomb Friday evening to Saturday evening, Saturday evening to Sunday morning, and on the third day he's risen. Yes. Right. Let us know if you have any questions. We don't want anybody to be confused. No. And it's there <laughs> if you need it just in the scripture. It's in Luke. It's in Mark. Like, it's very clear. Paul mentions it here. He's heard it first. Paul is writing this letter probably around 40 or 50 AD before the other gospels get written. And by that time, he had heard that level of detail that Jesus dies and resurrects on the third day. And he says, according to the scriptures. Amen. So if it doesn't make sense to you, Believe it by faith, yes. because God's word is true. Amen. So would you read our Keep in Mind scripture as we close this beautiful lesson on resurrection hope? Absolutely. And so this is from 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 19 through 20. And it says, if our hope in Christ is only for this life, we are more to be pitied than anyone in the world. In fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. He is the first of a great harvest of all who have died. Amen, amen. Have a wonderful celebration with your church family, with your individual families, and tell somebody this good news. God bless you. Well, friends, this is Bishop Andy Segura. That takes up just about all of my time, and I certainly want to thank you for yours. Again, I want to thank you, M.I., out of Chicago and their Christian educator for this week's lesson on the International Sunday School lesson. I pray that it has positively impacted your life and that you have benefited from it. I'm here every week with these lessons and I hope that you will join me in the future. Again, I'm Bishop Andy C. Luda. Thank you for your time. Always remember, God loves you, we love you, and we look forward to seeing you real soon.